pray. I'm going to start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask thee this day to pour your Holy Spirit upon me. Lord, I ask you that your words would be spoken here today, not by words. And that each person here would receive a blessing from the words that are spoken here this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Sychar was near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to Joseph. And Joseph's well was there. The Jews and the Samaritans, they had a bad history. They never get along. There was racial divides between the two of them. There was nothing that a Jew could do for a Samaritan. It was forbidden. Only out of strict necessity were they allowed to interact with each other, save for the purchase of food. Now Jesus was tired from his journey. This was an example of the human frailties that Jesus took on on our behalf. The creator of all is now sitting down in a well, dependent on the water that he created on this tiny planet to quench his thirst. His condescension to become one like us is an act of love. Now Jesus is tired, dusty, and thirsty. He has no bucket to draw water from this well to quench his thirst. All he can do now is to sit and to wait for someone to come by to draw water from the well and ask for them a drink. We are not told how long Jesus was sitting there. It could have been a few minutes or it could have been hours. Jesus could have been sitting there all day for all we know. This, but all he has to do is just wait for someone to bring him a drink. Being, Jesus could have been looking around here or off into the distance, scanning across the room, across the countryside, looking for someone to come. Then he sees a woman approaching. She has a water jug, but this woman's a Samaritan. But to Jesus, this is a lost sheep, one of the ones whom he came to save. This woman approached Jesus and didn't seem to realize that he was there or didn't show that he was there. She came to fill her pitcher. She lowered her pitcher into the well, drew the water and brought it up. And when she was ready to leave, Jesus turned to her and said, give me a drink. Imagine what was going through her mind. This man is a Jew and he just asked me for a drink. The urge to refuse him must have come through her mind because he was a Jew. But the favor he asked, she could not refuse because of her culture. In the East, water was called the gift from God. To offer water to a thirsty traveler was a duty so sacred that the people of the desert went out of their way to perform it. But this was a Jew, and she was astonished that a Jew would have spoken to her, let alone ask her for a favor. Then she asked, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. The woman must have been almost mortified. Because in her mind, she could not wrap her head around a Jew coming forth to ask her a question, let alone speak to her. They hated each other so much that this, Jesus had just done the unthinkable. Jesus looked at her and said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says this to you, give me a drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you the living water. Those words stirred something inside of the woman. She did not quite fully understand them, but she felt the solemnity of the words that Jesus spoke. They began to awaken something in her mind. Thinking that he spoke of the well in front of me, she said, Sir, you have nothing to draw, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, and drank from it himself, and fed his sons and his livestock? So she is drawing a comparison between Jesus and Jacob. She does not know yet that this is the promised Messiah, she just sees a man that is sitting at the well that is tired and well-traveled. However, the words that he is speaking is awakening something within her. 
Jesus responds to her question by saying, Whoever drinks of this water that I shall give to him shall thirst no more. Whoever but the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up unto eternal life. When Jesus spoke of the water, it wasn't the physical water that he was speaking of. It was the things of this world that we use to try to satisfy the void. We try to satisfy a thirst that the grace that Christ alone can provide will quench. People go through life trying to fill a void within themselves that cannot be filled. No matter what you try to fill it with, there is a place where the living water that comes from Christ is placed within you that quenches your thirst and fills your void. And that lived, living water springs up within you because Christ lived within you. Amen. Only Jesus can fill the void that is left within you. And the only thing that will satisfy that longing in your soul is Christ, and there is no shortage of Jesus. Amen. When you experience the love of Jesus Christ in your heart, everything in this world that has to offer begins to pale in comparison to the one from whom all blessings flow. Your desire for the world begins to lessen until it is gone completely, and all that you want is Jesus. And then, when he lives in you, he will satisfy you continually. Now this flip, swip, the switch is flipped in the mind of the woman. She realizes that this man cannot be talking about the well. She looks more attentively as her mind starts to awaken to the words of Jesus. She knows that this living water is something that she wants because it is something that is to be desired and possibly something that she needs. She then says, Sir, give me this water that I may thirst no more. Jesus changed the conversation abruptly. Before she could re receive the gift he had longed to give her, she must be brought to recognize her sin and her Savior. Jesus said to her, Go, call thy husband, and come here. I can imagine instantly the lump that formed in the back of her throat, for she knew she had no husband. She said, I have no husband. She had hoped that all questioning would end with that statement, but Jesus pressed on further. He said, Thou hast said well, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now is not thy husband. In that thou saidest truth. So to paraphrase Jesus, he said, It is right that you have said that you don't have a husband, because you have had five husbands before now, and the man that you are shacking up with, the one that you are living with, he is not your husband. What you said is true. The woman must have been reeling at this point. Her dark secrets, which she wished to keep secret, are now being brought to light and thrust to the forefront of her mind. Who is this man who could reveal her hidden sins? She stood there, trembling before Jesus. She was dumbfounded by the words that he spoke. When she was able to speak, immediately she tried to shift the conversation from what had just been spoken. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Then, hoping to silence the conviction, she turns to points of religious controversy. If this was surely a prophet, he could tell her the things concerning the matters which have been disputed for so long between the Jews and the Samaritans. Jesus patiently waited for his opportunity to bring the truth home to her heart while he allowed her to direct the conversation until he found the right moment to drive it home. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. The Jews and the Samaritans fought over which place was to worship. The place of worship was a hotly contested point between the Jews and the Samaritans, and the well was in sight of Mount Gerizim, where the ruins of the temple that the Samaritans had built lay. The Samaritans were descendants of the Jews, but because they had been conquered by an idolatrous nation because of their sins, and they were influenced by the heathen idolatry. While it is true, they said that their idols 
served only to remind them of the true of the living God. This is not the form of worship that God finds acceptable. And they began to reverence the idols themselves. The Samaritans a long time ago wanted to join the Jews in the building of the temple after the exile of the Babylonians. The Jews ref refused them this privilege. This is where the hatred from the Jews and the Samaritans began. And it grew up from that. It only got worse from time. So the Samaritans built their own temple. But calamity after calamity befell the Samaritans, yet they still clung to their idolatrous ways. Because of their hatred of the Jews, they refused to acknowledge that the Jews were keeping worship the way God intended it to be, that it was superior to their own religion. Jesus goes on to say, Woman, believe me that the hour cometh when ye shall neither worship in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Jesus is a barrier breaker, and he is seeking to break down the barrier within this Samaritan woman. He showed that he had no prejudice against her when he asked of her a drink, and now he is looking, down, looking to break her barriers against the Jews down. Jesus is also pointing to the fact that the religion of the Jews is from God, and the truce of redemption had been committed to them. They were the light bearers of the world, and from them the Messiah, who she did not know was standing right in front of her, was to come from them. He moved on to say that the hour cometh now, and is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Hmm. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Unless we are born again, baptized by the Holy Spirit, born of it, we cannot serve God. No mere outward show of religion can suffice. We cannot have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. The Spirit will purify us and open our hearts and minds to God. He will renew our faculties and plant a love and appreciation for God in us. We know that now that these words are stirring up inside the minds of the woman. New thoughts and new ideas are awakening within her. From the conversation she's having with Jesus, she is slowly beginning to piece things together and in her mind, she's asking, could this be him? She said to Jesus, I know the Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. I can picture Jesus now taking a pause, taking a moment to think, and looking straight at her and saying, I that speak unto thee am he. Every piece of the puzzle came rushing to the forefront of her mind as a completed picture. It was him. Faith springs forth from her heart, sweeping everything else aside. The spirit is at work here. Her mind had been opened to the words of Jesus. This water of life had begun to spring up within her heart. Her hopes had been realized. She is standing in the presence of the promised one. In her mind, she realizes she has to tell someone. As quickly as that thought enters her mind, she is gone. Gone so quickly that she forgets all about her water pot at the well. I can imagine she is running into town so fast, telling everybody that walked by, come see a man which told me all the things that I did do. Is this not the Christ? Hmm. She brought all that were here to come to see Jesus. This is the working of the well that springs up within us. It is a water that cannot be kept to oneself. When we are born of the Spirit, we want all we know, all who we know, to drink from the living water, to taste the fountain that quenched the thirst of our souls. 
We want all to come to the one who has renewed us and who has revitalized us. When we are born of the Spirit, we don't care who the person is or who they were or what they have done. We want them to just drink from the living water. It becomes our mission to join with Jesus in calling out to the people to come drink the living water. We cannot sit idle. We must do all that we can to share that water, whether it be in words or in actions. We seek the opportunity to share the Creator's love. The well was never meant for just one person. It is an inexhaustible supply meant for all the world. Today, this day, I call upon all of you, all of us, to drink from this living water and to thirst no more. No matter where you are in your walk with Christ, he wants us to drink freely at this life-giving fountain which is Jesus Christ. The word of God is the fountain which we drink at. Let us turn to this fountain each day under the guidance of the Spirit so that our longing can be quenched. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. Amen. The word is what connects us to Christ. Let, what lets him abide in us. Stand with me today if you want to drink from the fountain that will quench the longing of your soul. Amen. All right, let's pray.